Good afternoon, everyone, and my name is Rich Longo. I'll be your host for today's presentation, and it looks like we still have a lot of folks that are trying to get dialed in and logged in today, so we'll get our introduction going anyway and give them some time, but we have folks from all over the North American continent joining us today. Today's webinar is on organizational change management. It looks like we struck a chord here, Chuck. Chuck Spencer being our, our presenter today. Uh, Chuck started with Flycast Partners last year to help build and expand our process improvement offerings uh, for our existing and future business partners. As our new organizational change manager practitioner, he came to us with a very accomplished background that includes Lean Six Sigma Black Belt and ITIL V3 expert with multiple certifications, including ISO 20000 Manager and Consultant, COVID-5, PMP, Agile Scrum Master, and Change Management Practitioner. Chuck has over 25 years of experience in improving and implementing service management processes to drive quality, efficiency, and customer satisfaction. He's an innovative and results-oriented senior technology leader with progressive experience in all phases of service management, project, process management, enterprise technical support, organizational leadership, and strategic development. There's a lot more in there, and, and uh, he's actually been here a little bit longer than, than a year or two now. And uh, it's been a great asset to the Flycast Partners team, and I know our customers love him. Uh, before we get started, Chuck, let me introduce our organization, Flycast Partners. For those of you that aren't aware of who we are and what we do, Flycast Partners is here to deliver a seriously amazing IT experience. We were founded and staffed by personnel that have many years of experience in the IT space, and we took the best ideas from all of these collective experiences and added the best components necessary to grow and become a leading value-added reseller in the North American IT market. We offer best-in-class implementation services and training in ITSM, ITAM, batch processing, capacity optimization, and enterprise service management using ITIL best practice. Our professional services team can easily scale up or down to meet the IT needs of any customer, regardless of how big you are, how complex, or what your budgetary restrictions are. We offer implementation services both on-site and remote, as well as training to reinforce your organization's long-term IT success. Our ongoing remote administration and support service offerings will enable your organization to focus on those normal day-to-day -day operations, saving you both precious time and money. I encourage you to give us a call at 844-FLYCAST, that's 844-359-2278. Reach out to us, let us know some of the issues you're having or some of the projects you have coming up. We'll be more than happy to speak with you. Or you can simply go to our website at www.flycastpartners.com and at our website, you can actually chat with us on our little chat window. And we have people monitoring that Monday through Friday during normal business hours. This is just one of many, many webinars that we offer here at Flycast Partners, and I encourage you to go to our webinar page and see what some of the upcoming presentations are. This week, of course, being organizational change management, and next week we're addressing uh, true site operations management. Um, we have a couple of other uh, ITIL-centric webinars coming up a little bit later in uh, November, and then, of course, we start an entire series in January. Uh, back into the ITIL frame of mind. I encourage you to also take a look at some of the resources that we provide here on our website, anything from training to process uh, help that your organization may need to help get people realigned, get, it, get the stakeholders talking again, uh, or white papers. We have data sheets. Take a look at our website. Poke around a little bit. And you can always reach out yet again at 844-FLYCAST-359-2278. Now, without further ado, as I, I continue to watch the number of people multiply by the second here, I'm going to go ahead and still turn this over to uh, Chuck. Chuck, it looks like we have a lot of interest in today's presentation. So I've just slide, I've slid the screen over to you, so you now have control of the screen. and. Uh, yeah, as as we get started today, I, you know, I just want to want to mention, you know, why do you refer to organizational change management as the other change management? Well, Rich, you know, most of us who've been in IT for a while and involved in ITEL and IT service management, 
recognize change management as the process to you know, transition services from design into operations, whether that be new services or modifications to existing services and systems, and looking at the sign-up list for today's presentations and at what folks were hoping to learn, it seems like many of our listeners were expecting us to talk about this change management. Now, if you're one of those folks, please don't drop off because there are things you will learn here today as we talk about organizational change management that will help you with implementing ITIL change management. A lot of the problems mentioned on the sign-up sheet are on how to get the people in the organization to buy into ITIL change management, which you do through organizational change management. Uh, but there's often a, a little confusion around which change management we're talking about. And, and let me share a quick story with you because it kind of tells how I got into organizational change management really. About 20 years ago, I had a client that I'd done some ITIL process implementation work for, including ITIL change management. And she called me to tell me that she had taken on a new role with a major company here in Dallas as the director of program management for a project they had underway to implement SAP and that they needed someone to come on board and lead the change management effort. Now, she knew this is right up my alley. This is something I'd done for her before, like I said, you know, was I available? And the only catch to it was they didn't want to do this with a consultant. They wanted someone on their staff. But hey, it was a two-year deal. It was here in Dallas. There was no travel. The money was good. It was kind of a no-brainer for me at the time. And since I was coming on board as an employee, I mean, we didn't bother with a contract or a statement of work. There were no deliverables up front that we talked about. Uh, they didn't really have a good job description even for what they gave me, so I just showed up for the work on the first day as change manager, only to find out that the lady that had hired me had gone off on maternity leave and she wasn't there. And so I was given a few introductions to some of the leadership team and told to go do your change management thing and get a plan together. And so I did. I started asking for documentation on their change process. I started interviewing stakeholders to assess how well it was working, and I got a lot of funny looks and questions. You know, they actually seemed to have a really mature ITEL infrastructure change management process in place. They had a process owner, they had a manager, things were well documented, they were having their cab meetings, you know, they wondered why I was there. And they told me their understanding was that I was supposed to focus only on this SAP project and manage how that was going to get moved into production. Now to me, that sounded a lot more like release management, but okay. So I headed down that path. and. You know, they had a major consulting firm contracted to do the SAP uh, development implementation, and I set up a meeting with them to discuss release and change management as, a, as it applied to their environments, and I got the same funny looks and questions. Why was I there? They had it under control. They had an SDLC process. It was in place. It was working. You know, no idea why I was really there. So about this time, the lady who hired me came back to work and told me that we had a meeting with her boss that afternoon, and the CTO wanted me to present my change management plan. Well, I won't go into details, but it was a complete disaster. And it became quickly and painfully clear that they had not hired me to do ITIL change management, but rather the other change management, organizational change management. Now, it was something I was really not prepared for. I had some skills in this area, but not a lot. I knew some of the techniques, not a lot. You know, it was probably the most uncomfortable two years of my life but it also forced me to go through some changes and do some change management of my own skills, and I learned a lot. And it gave me a new appreciation for the skills and techniques really needed to do the other change management, organizational change management, and a new perspective on how important this aspect really is to any process or tool implementation that you're going to do. And I used what I learned for the last 20 years in helping other organizations go through organizational change management as they've tried to implement new processes and they've tried to implement new tools. And what I learned is what I'm gonna share with you all in the next few minutes here. So the first thing I learned was that organizational change is a misnomer. You don't really change the organization. You help the people in the organization change their behaviors, their work habits, which in turn moves the organization in the direction it needs to go. And you do this by helping them transition from something we call the current state to the desired state, the state the organization needs to be in to be successful with whatever it is they're trying to do. And to accomplish this, there are some specific things that are required. I mean, first, of course, you need to have a vision that provides a clear and simple picture of what the organization being changed will look like once the change has been completed. And the second is sponsorship, which we're gonna talk quite a bit more about in a moment. And then along with sponsorship comes the need to have well-defined roles, responsibilities, who does what, when, how. 
And then stakeholder management, which really involves communication. And communication for organizational change management needs to be an effective combination of both one-way and two-way communication with the real emphasis on two-way communication. Now, I said earlier that you don't change an organization, you change the people within that organization. And you do that by enabling them to make a change. And this enablement comes through empowerment. Change occurs when people are well-trained, when they're highly motivated, and they have the freedom, the empowerment, to try things out in a safe environment where success is celebrated and rewarded and failure, while it's not really desired, is accepted as long as there's knowledge gained that you can then apply to turn that failure into a success. And then effective organizational change management also requires resistance management. You're going to get resistance to any change. You have to plan for it ahead of time. You have to plan how you're going to deal with it. And then when it happens, you have to quickly remove it and get it out of your way. And then finally, Effective organizational change management requires continual positive reinforcement. People need to be nurtured along the way in the change process. You need to find and celebrate quick wins. You need to help them get over obstacles. You need to encourage them to keep moving forward. It's almost the same thing you do when you're teaching a child to ride a bike or to walk or I'm teaching my grandsons now to play a ukulele. You know, it's all those kinds of things of just stepping them along the way and getting them headed where you need them to go. This sounds like a lot to be concerned with, Chuck. So where in the world do you start? Well, you, you really start with sponsorship. That's where it really all begins. And this is really a must have for the organizational change effort. I mean, you're transforming the way you do business today, and that requires significant sponsorship from the top levels of the organization. And this means getting top-down commitment from some form of an organizational governing body, whether that's an executive board, a steering committee, or just a group of top-level leaders. And that top-down commitment needs to be exemplified by having a visible and sustained commitment and involvement of those change sponsors throughout the initiative so that they're attending learning events, they're attending significant stakeholder meetings. They need to be constantly visible and committed and involved in the change to make it work. And then the sponsors need to select in some support some respected resources within the organization to act as change agents. And these people are there to really help ensure that the individuals make the change. And to do that, these people themselves need to have some appropriate skills. They need to have some training in the facilitation of change. And of course, they need to have the time to really act as change agents to get involved. And then sponsorship means empowering the individuals and the groups to take on initiatives in line with the changes that you're trying to get accomplished, and do this by providing them a mix of responsibility and authority along with training and experience and knowledge about what you're trying to accomplish. And then finally, sponsorship means providing, again, that continual, consistent, and wide communication of the vision, the importance of reaching that vision and the progress towards that vision. Now, Prosky, who is a recognized leader in organizational change management, did a study in 2012 with 650 participants in 62 countries, and he identified the greatest contributor to the overall success of a change management initiative as being active and visible executive sponsorship. And then the greatest obstacle, according to those same respondents, the thing that stopped things from happening was ineffective management sponsorship from senior leaderships or senior leaders. Now I can tell you that the implementations that I've been involved, whether that's implementing a ITIL change management process or a new tool, the ones that did not have strong leadership inevitably failed. And I can give you examples of those for the next three or four days if uh, we really wanted to talk about those. Now, once you have that sponsorship, the sponsor or the sponsors need to work together to create a vision that outlines how the organization wants to be seen by the outside world. What picture do they want others to see when others look at the organization? And Joseph Cotter, who's a well-known leader in the area of organizational change management, takes that a bit further by saying it's not just a picture of where do you want to be, but you have to give them a compelling reason of why we need to get to that picture, why we need to achieve that vision. You know, if you can just look at the past election that we had, and whether you're a Trump fan or not a Trump fan, you know, his motto will make America great again was a vision that people could get behind, they could see the value of that, you wanted to do it, you wanted to help make it happen. Uh, again, we can argue whether or not it's being done, but 
it still was a great vision and really gave people the, both a picture of what it should be and a reason for wanting to get there. Now, once you've established the vision, it's important to now create your strategy for organizational change management. How will you manage change within your organization? You know, do you have the resources and the capability to do this internally, or do you need to use a consulting or a third-party organization to help you bring about these changes? And there are pros and cons to either method and either approach to doing that. And then you develop some strategic objectives that allow you to then identify a number of change initiatives that you can make part of your change portfolio, and each one of those needs to have some expected outcomes and benefits associated to them. And then each one of these initiatives, you want to be short, make sure they have achievable time frames so that you can keep the momentum going. And of course, you're constantly checking to ensure that the results is actually contributing to the vision that you put forward. Sounds like we need a team of people to carry out the strategy. Can you talk to us about who actually does this? Well, you're right, there are a number of change management roles that you have to make sure are filled in the organization, and they're key to organizational change management. And these, those include the change sponsor, which we've kind of talked about, but we'll talk a little more about because it's so important. And also the change manager, change agents, lines manager, and the targets, or the, the change targets themselves. And the sponsor, what we're really asking them to do is be good leaders. We're asking them to articulate and maintain a clear and attractive vision for the change. Make sure everyone in the organization understands it, they know why it's important that we achieve that vision, and they're moving everyone towards that. And they need to act as champions for the change and create a sense of urgency around why it must be done, why it must be done now, and the, and the speed with which it needs to be done. The sponsor or sponsors need to gain commitment and involvement of other senior and line managers and ensure that those managers are informed that they're engaged and that they provide resources as needed to really accomplish the change. And then the sponsors need to act as a role model. They need to lead the way in establishing new norms. They need to walk the talk. You hear that all the time. They need to really show that they're behind this and they want this to happen. They need to consistently communicate the change using a variety of different media, whether that's you know just hallway conversations or town halls or email blast or whatever the case may be, and then the sponsors are often going to be called upon to confront those who resist or block the change, and that sometimes means removing an obstacle, and sometimes that obstacle can actually be a person, which is sometimes difficult to do for a lot of reasons, but it has to be done. They need to be involved in training and mentoring and coaching. They need to be accessible to the change stakeholders whenever they're needed, and they need to ensure that the resources needed for change are available, and that includes things like just aligning the infrastructure, the environment, performance measurement and reward systems to the change initiative to make sure that they support that. And then they need to continually be ensuring alignment to the organization's strategic goals and make sure that all of the change objectives and initiatives continue to contribute to the overall strategic goals of the company as those change because those do change over time. Now the terms change manager and project manager sound the same and but they're not synonymous. You know, there's a fundamental difference between change manager and what a change, man change management and what a change manager does and project management and what a project manager does. A project manager works to achieve project completion and manage events, budgets, timelines, all to complete a specific objective, the focus being on completion. And there's very little gray. It's all black and white. It's completed or it's not completed. A change manager, on the other hand, focuses on the implementation and on the transition of people, and I'm talking about an organizational change manager here now, from the current state to the desired state by managing their beliefs, their behaviors, their communication, their resistance, making sure they get education and training. And nothing here is black and white, trust me, it's all gray. I learned that over and over during those first years of doing this. Now a change manager is defined by his or her knowledge and competence and organizational change management, just like a good project manager is defined by his or her knowledge and competence in PMBOK or PRINCE or whatever methodology you're using. And most organizations are willing to spend money on acquiring and training project managers, but unfortunately this is often not the case for organizational change management. And instead they rely on people who are good PMs to understand and to deliver organizational change management, which often creates a conflict. And now, you know, that's not to say that there's not an element of organizational change management in every project and that all PMs 
have no understanding of organizational change management. It's just that rarely do you find one that does and rarely do you find that they have developed the skills and the experience and the knowledge for those softer skills that are required for organizational change management. Change agents, I mean, just like the change manager and project manager aren't synonymous, change managers and change agents aren't synonymous either. Uh, change agents, unlike change managers, usually have no formal authority to facilitate change in the organization. The only reason people are listening to them is because they respect them. And that, that's a great reason, really, to be listening to them. And while they may be supervisors, they may be line managers, they may be senior managers, they might even be the change manager, when they're in the role of change agent, they do that without direct line authority. And their role is really more of a coaching or a consulting role. So their responsibilities include things like networking to build strong change networks in the organization. And again, in doing so, they're often connecting to the frontline staff and to line managers and to those people that are involved in the change that are their peers or people that they work with, they're in similar positions. And their responsibilities also include ensuring effective communication occurs up and down the organizational hierarchy to ensure consistency and understanding of the message and making sure that mostly that those messages are getting and feedback is getting back up to the change sponsors. And then you have your local leaders and your line managers and they play an important role in change management and it, they're the ones responsible for creating and implementing the plans usually to actually meet the change strategy. They need to budget, they need to forecast resources, and they often need to do project management for the changes that are actually being implemented. They need to act as a role model for their teams in the way that they accept the change and they communicate the need for the change and the alignment to the strategy. And then they're responsible for ensuring communication again is bi-directional and that they're getting feedback and they're putting both information out there and getting feedback. And when there's resistance, managing that resistance by confronting it and removing it wherever possible or if not escalating it up to the change manager. And then finally we have the, the poor targets, the people that we're trying to implement this change on. Um, their responsibilities really include listening to the information that's being provided to them, inquiring or challenging that information if it's not clear, to clarify any concerns they might have regarding the change. They need to offer criticism and ideas to further improve or speed the delivery of change. We want them involved in the change, not just being changed. And then they should always, of course, again, be providing feedback to the sponsors and the change manager. All right, Chuck, now you've done a great job identifying the team. What do they need to do at this point? Well, one of the first things that you do in organizational change management is start to identify your stakeholders. And one way to do that is stakeholder mapping. It's really a valuable tool in organizational change management. And it begins with identifying all your stakeholders and then categorizing them by placing them on a grid or a map based on the level of power and influence they might have on the change and then the level of interest they have in the change or the impact the change will have on them. And this allows you to begin to understand how much focus, attention, and communication you need to do with these stakeholders. Obviously, keep people who are key players, you need to engage actively. You have to really be involved with them. People who are just um, spectators, you know, they just need to, you know, let them know what's going on. Make sure they can monitor what's happening. You know, if you have someone who's an influential observer, you have to make sure they're satisfied because they're not going to allow this change to happen if they can influence its success or failure in any way unless you keep them satisfied. And then people who are active players, you know, you want to keep them informed, let them know what's going on. So putting your stakeholders in these types of maps is one way to do that. Another useful approach is to segment the stakeholders. And this is a common practice you probably use in marketing, Rich, and it allows you to gain a better understanding of the different stakeholders and what might appeal to each segment based on their priorities as a group. How do you market the change to them? And the segments shown here are really just examples. You'll come up with your own segments in your organization. But keep in mind, whichever of these techniques you use, it's rinse and repeat. You have to keep doing this continuously within your transition timeline. And then once you've segmented those stakeholders, if you use the approach we just talked about, you want to identify the level of engagement that needs to incur with each stakeholder group. And one useful tool for doing that is to create a visual representation using a stakeholder map and identify the stakeholders that being vital to the change, necessary to the change, good to have engaged, or just a courtesy to inform. So again, very similar to the stakeholder mapping, 
just a different way of doing it. And again, it doesn't matter which of these you use, it's just that you continually reassess this. Now, Patrick Mayfield, another leader in the area of organizational change management, uh, gave us some really good advice. First thing he gave us in the seven principles of management was, you can forget about stakeholders, they won't forget about you. And that's true long after you are gone, which you probably will be if you forget about a key stakeholder. And then secondly, identification is a continuous practice. You're going to have new stakeholders emerge during the change, older ones are gonna go away, people's roles or responsibilities are gonna change. You need to be aware of that and continuously identify those stakeholders. And then you're prioritizing and segmenting stakeholders, as I've said already a couple times, it's a moment in time. So regularly priorize that. People's interests change, again, their positions change, um, their roles change, and all of this changes the way that you communicate and deal with them. And then fourth, recognize that some stakeholders are best engaged by others. And this is especially true if you're an outsider managing the change effort or acting as a change agent. Some people only respond to their peers or to respected leaders, and they're not actually disengaged if they're approached by the wrong person or someone that they don't trust, respect and trust. And then seek first to understand and then be understood. Listen to their needs and their concerns and feed off of those versus just telling them what they need to do and why they need to change. Emotion trumps reason. And you can certainly see this in our political environment today, no pun intended, and, and some of the changes that are taking place in this environment. You do need, you do not need to only recognize that emotion trumps reason, but you need to use that to your advantage in trying to transition someone towards the desired state. Feed on their emotion. Use their emotion to help them move the way that you want them to move. And then finally, demonstration trumps argument. You know, showing someone how the change will or will not affect them is often better than just telling them about it or arguing with them about it. So as much as possible, let your stakeholders experience or try out or pilot the new application or the new process or the new way of doing business in a safe environment. You know, we often use simulations when we're trying to implement IT service management processes for an organization to demonstrate the value they'll receive from that change. We'll do the same, same things with other changes that you're trying to make. Can you share with us some specific techniques uh, on how to motivate these stakeholders to make the changes that are needed? Because that, that's a rough one. Well, it is, and there are a couple of things that you have to do as you're doing that. First off, you need to really identify your stakeholders and analyze what it's gonna to take to get them transitioned to the new desired state. And as part of doing that, you wanna look at the organization's capabilities for change in four specific areas. First, what's the capability within the people that you're trying to change to absorb knowledge? How much can they take on? How much education? How much training can they absorb? Uh, how much can they generate? You know, what's their capability to really take on change from an individual level? And then what's the organization's capability to handle change? How have you, how's the organization responded to before when you've had changes in the organizational structure and has it been a, too many times and you know, doing it one more is just gonna confuse things. And then finally, you know, what's the, cap or not finally, but next is what's the capability of your processes? If you're putting in a new tool, what processes have to change to support those new outcomes? If you're looking at a new way of doing business, what processes do you have to change and what has to take there? How much can those processes absorb? And then finally, just the environment itself. Think about things like space and real estate and infrastructure. Um, you know, do you have sufficient meeting rooms? Do you have areas to have town halls? Do you have facilities that can do um, billboard announcements and bull bulletin announcements and that sort of thing? You know, all of these have to be looked at from both the organizational as well as the stakeholder perspective. So the, so the first thing is to look at the organization's capability for change. But then when you're trying to actually change people, there's a technique we call unfreeze and refreeze. And this is really important to, to try to get people to change. And to do this, you try to unfreeze them, make the change, and then freeze them again. And it's sort of like the game my grandsons play called Frozen, where it gets everybody moving, you tag them, they gotta stop, and then give them some time and they take off moving again. Well, this concept as it applies to organizational change management was identified by Kurt Lewin, and it suggests, his technique suggests that you do this by creating a competing anxiety or a survival anxiety around the change. And you do this 
by breaking down their existing habits and their mindsets. And there are three really key elements in being able to do this. First, you need to clearly define the situation they're in and what is it about it that makes them comfortable? Why do they want to stay where they're at? And then involve the change targets in discussing this because the more of them are the, you, you have involved, the better the definition you're going to get of why they're comfortable and where they are. And then second, create a vision of the desired state. And here I recommend using the people who are truly, truly understand the organizational vision and why it's important. Bring in those sponsors, bring in those key leaders, bring in those change agents. And again, here the more people you have involved, the better the definition is going to be. And then third, identify the forces that will both drive and resist the change. And then try to increase or leverage those driving forces while decreasing or removing the resisting forces that you've identified. Then once you set the, the stage for change, it's time to take the people through the change. And here again, you want to create a safe environment where they can learn, where you can allow them to experience the change. And recognize that during this stage, there's going to be confusion as the change is first introduced and they're struggling as to how to do things. And stakeholders will often challenge the change or need some clarification on the change and why we need to do it and what we need to do. And this is where you need to have consistency in the way that you communicate the vision and the value of the desired state. And then the last stage is to refreeze them. And this is a stage where the new work practices become new work habits and the new way of thinking is the norm. And as change managers and leaders, your job isn't done because you need to address any tendency that people are going to have to go back to the old ways. And trust me, they're going to go back to what's comfortable for them. So when that happens, you have to immediately step in, get them redirected, get them, again, getting these new mindsets and habits really locked into the way they're doing business. Now, another gentleman by the name of Shine built on this concept in 1993 by suggesting that the organization really do this by creating an environment using what's really three seemingly conflicting activities. The first being discomfiture, which is creating the, the, the disturbing belief that the current situation is unsustainable. You know, as a company, if we continue to do things this way, we're going to lose our competitive advantage. Our competitors are going to take over. It's going to affect us in ways that aren't good. And then create the guilt or an anxiety amongst the change targets themselves. The belief that if they don't change, if I don't change, not only will the organization fail or not survive, but I'm not going to achieve my goals either, whether those be personal goals or career goals. I'm trying to buy a house. If the company goes under, I'll have a job. Uh, I mean, that sounds harsh, but that's the kind of thing you want to get people feeling, that they own some piece of this, and it's not just affecting the company, it's affecting them. And then create a barrier, uh, an area of psychological safety. And while this seems to conflict with the first two, it's really designed to help prevent the survival anxiety from becoming too great. You have to give them a way out. Let them see that there's a safe way to learn and to move forward. Um, and that there's a, a good place for them to be going and they can, you know, solve all of these problems if we can make these changes and make this work. You know, if, you, if any of you have read Joseph Cotter's book, Our Iceberg is Melting, uh, it really speaks to this concept. And if you haven't read it, I highly recommend it. it. It really is a great book that talks to this concept and really speaks to creating this anxiety, making sure people understand why they have to change, and then giving them a safe place to change to. So what about communication? Uh, you talked to that earlier as being an important component of organizational change management. Where is Where does that fit in? Well, it, it really is. It, it really fits in the beginning because at the same time you're doing your stakeholder management plan, you need to start doing your communication planning. And it's, an, again, important that you do this at the very start of your change effort because communication needs to occur all the way through the initiative. It shouldn't just be happening at the tail end. And it begins with developing a communication strategy that outlines the overall communication objectives for the change initiative and the key messages that need to be delivered and the approaches that will be used. And then comes the actual development of the plan itself. How are you going to deliver the strategy in terms of who does what, when, how, and to whom do they deliver these messages? And by the way, this is where the other type of change management comes into play because this plan itself should be subject to change management. So that if you make any changes to this communication plan during the course of organizational change management, you're analyzing the risk, getting those changes approved, and getting those recorded. 
And of course, then comes the actual carrying out of the activities um, of communication to ensure that the objectives outlined in the strategy are actually being achieved. And there's a difference between the strategy and the communication plan itself. And you know, your strategy needs to center on first the understanding your organizational context. Why are we doing this? Why are we changing? What are the drivers? What is the nature of the change and the culture and the environment in which the change is taking place? And then second, analyzing the audience and stakeholders. And at the strategy level, we're really just looking at who are the people we will be communicating with, where are they in terms of their awareness of the change, the reasons that we need to communicate them to them, their attitude towards the change, and the likelihood and nature of any resistance within this stakeholder group. We want to set communication objectives, our third objective here. You know, what do we want to happen for each stakeholder segment? Based on what we talked about above, what do we need them to know? What do we need them to think? What do we need them to feel or do as a result of communication? And then we need to make sure that these objectives are measurable, that we can link them to key milestones for the change initiative. And then fourth, as part of the strategy, select the communication approaches. How are we going to go about this? If it's a major cultural shift that requires a much different approach than if you're just rolling out a new computer system or a tool upgrade due to the difference in the, the need to change behaviors and attitudes. And as some changes are not well planned from the beginning, but emerge as the result of other changes. So in this case, how the change involved might dictate how you're going to have to communicate that change. And you know, where the change is driven from the top, the approach is more on informing them and then selling them on the change. Uh, a common mistake is to try and sell the change too early before people really recognize the need for change and accept that changes have to occur in order for the organization or for them to be successful. And then as part of the strategy, develop some key messages and themes. What exactly is it that we're going to say? The messages need to be consistent, whether they're coming from the managers or the senior manager. Um, you know, it helps to overcome resistance when the change targets are getting the same message across the board. So document these key messages, turn them into elevator speeches, uh, turn them into communication packs or slide presentations with frequently asked questions. And then don't make them just about the facts. Tell stories, use graphics, make them interesting so that people are looking at them and they want to see them. And then sixth, identify who's going to deliver these key messages. Who are the key influencers within the specific groups? Who are the people that are highly respected that people will listen to? Who are the right champions that uh, have the influence and the credibility to deliver these key messages at each stage? And then finally, select the communication channels, how the message is going to get there. And it's important that your channels are used consistently to avoid confusion and really encourage feedback. You know, newsletters and emails are good for raising awareness or bulletin style updates. But where you need fuller participation and feedback, you need to have workshops and town halls and round tables or focus groups, things like that. So determine what communication channels you need to use and what messages should be going out through which communication channels. And then once the communication plan is in place, or the strategy is in place, then the plan really looks at the details for each one of those specific communications. You know, who is the specific target audience? Who is the, what is the objective of this particular communication? What's the key message that it's supporting? What type of activity are we going to use for it? And who the owner, who's the actual person who's going to deliver it? Before we talked about maybe the level of leadership, now we're talking about who specifically is going to do this. And so from this, you can really put together a communication schedule that you can start to track this communication, make sure it's completed, and then measure the activity. Now we've talked a couple of times about um, communication paths being one way and being two way. You know, one way is great if you're just trying to inform some people to share some information. It takes a lot less effort, but you don't get much feedback from it. Where you really want to engage people and where you want a high level of interaction, it's got to be two way communication. You have to engage those stakeholders. You have to share input, not just deliver input. And you want their participation. And granted, this takes a lot longer, uh, but you're going to get more feedback. So before deciding which one of these you're going to use, consider what you're trying to achieve with the communication and then the level of interaction that's required to really make that communication work. So you've definitely identified who the stakeholders are and you've communicated out the plan. So where do you go from here? Well, get out of the way. <laughs> At this point, you have to empower awesome. the team and stand, and stand back. 
You, to succeed at change, organizations and leadership need to empower their people to change. They have to give up something, and sometimes that means giving up some control. But you're, to really empower people to make a change, you've got to give them skills, you've got to give them the education, you've got to give them the resources and training that they need to support and implement the change. And then, like I say, you need to get the, out of their way and let them do the change. So be prepared to give something. Give, be prepared to empower your people and let them really implement the change because they're the ones that are going to do it. All you can do is lead them, get them in the right direction. They're the ones that have to, they have to change. You know, and, and contrary to what you've heard, uh, resistance is not futile, but it is inevitable. Again, you're going to have it, and the key is to identify it, plan for it ahead of time, so that when it occurs, you can quickly mitigate it or move it out of your way. And Cantor identified 10 common reasons for resistance and gave us some tips on how to deal with them, how to deal with these. Now, in the interest of time, I'm, I'm not gonna go through each one of these, but as you can see, there are some key ways of doing this. You know, we're going to make this presentation available to you. You can look through these areas and talk about how to deal with these levels of resistance. But I can guarantee you, you're going to face every one of these reasons for resistance as you're trying to roll things out. And the methods that are shown here to really deal with it are good, solid methods that are best practice that folks have used that have really helped them deal with that. And there's a couple of pages of these here, you know, that we'll share with you as, as part of this presentation. If we were the Borg, this would be so much easier. It really would. It really would. Um, again, in the interest of time and be able to take some questions, I'm going to skip one slide here and really take you to what I think is the most important slide here, and because it really takes this whole uh, presentation and brings it all together. And this is really Cotter's eight-step approach to organizational change management. And again, this embodies a lot of what we've already talked about here. And and Cotter, if you're not familiar with him, is one of the best known experts on organizational change management. He's the author of numerous books and articles on change management, uh, one of his best known being this eight-step approach to organizational change management. And his first step is all about creating that sense of urgency, and it speaks to a lot of what we talked about a few minutes ago. You know, Cotter believes it's essential that a majority of the organization's employees and at least 75% of its managers and virtually all of the top executives believe that there is an organizational urgency to change, that there's a reason why you have to, that you have to change. There's something at risk here we don't, and you know, that needs to be clear to everyone. And then second, he recommends the creation of a guiding coalition, and we talked about this when we talked about our sponsorship. You know, this needs to contain people with strong positional power, with varied expertise, and the credibility across the organization to guide and direct the change effort. So it's your sponsors, it's your change agents, it's your change manager, it's the whole backbone behind your, behind your change. And then third step, he says, is develop that vision that I talked about earlier. Provide a picture of the future with some explicit or explicit commentary on why people should strive to achieve that vision. Why do we need to get here? And then fourth, communicate it. Make sure that it's clear, it's in direct language, Use verbal images, use analogies, use stories, you know, not only communicating it, but in including opportunities for discussion and for feedback with the leaders who are walking the talk and really helping you get that way. So make sure the people who are involved in the change get to speak with those leaders and have interface time with them. And then fifth is empowering the employee by ensuring that the organizations, the system, the structure to support employee action, to provide training, reward contribution, remove or sideline managers, or others who get in the way, but that's all there. And, and make sure when you're rewarding contribution that you're rewarding people who are involved in working on the change, but also rewarding people who are, left, are staying behind to do the work. Because often you've got people who are off on this glamorous project and they're getting all the recognition and they're getting all of the uh, perks and everything, but there are other poor people who are back there carrying the day-to-day -day load because Johnny's off doing something else. Well, make sure those people get rewarded too. Make sure that they're involved in, in getting some uh, benefit for what they're contributing to this change because they are contributing even though they're not directly involved. And then six, he says, you know, generate and celebrate some short-term wins. This is the best way to boost morale and to minimize negativity and to keep progress rolling. You know, in IT service management and continual service improvement, we talk about, uh, Plan, do, check, act is the Deming process for 
reiterative planning. And when you talk about uh, agile, you talk about this same sort of thing. When you're talking about agile development, and it's it's recognized today that this is the way to do things. Create short-term wins, let people celebrate those wins, and then quickly get them to move to the next step. And then seventh, you know, there's always going to be pressure to revert to old ways, uh, known ways of doing business. And Cotter recommends encouraging the guiding coalition to press on and deliver even more change with clear leadership and direction from the top. And where you get that resistance to people uh, wanting to change what works and what's done today, you know, this is talked about a little bit resistance, which we kind of brushed through, but, you know, one thing to do there is, you know, make sure that you're recognizing the fact that the way it was working was good for its time. Don't disparage that and say, well, that doesn't work. It did work, and there was a reason for it being that way, and often the people that you're trying to change are the people who made it that way. So recognize that and then consolidate that and build on it and talk about how this change is really building on what they did, not tearing down what they did. And then the final step from Cotter's perspective is, you know, institutionalize the change. And, you know, someone once said that culture eats strategy for breakfast, and it sometimes eats change as a second course. Well, you have to continually identify aspects of the old, old culture that threaten the change and then address them, as I mentioned earlier, by recognizing the value that they provided for their time and place, and then highlighting the benefits and the value of the new way of doing business, and then strengthen that new culture, and really make sure that it gets institutionalized into the way that you're doing business. And, you know, as I mentioned, too, this may sometimes mean making some tough decisions and replacing people who are too stuck in the old culture by promoting those who embrace and lead the transition to the new way of business. So there's this old saying that I have is sometimes it comes down to change the person or change the person. And oftentimes that's not easy to do, but it has to be done to make the changes you're trying to make. So that wraps this up. I mean, I know I've been going at a whirlwind pace here because there was so much to get in in this few minutes, but uh, Rich, do we have any questions that we need to answer here? And do we have time to answer we questions? We do. It, it, we do. We don't really have time to answer questions, but this is a big one. And I, I'm not sure if you're going to have time to answer this entire question or not, but I'm going to read it off, and maybe you can touch on it. Maybe we can get back to these folks. Um, they want to know, <clears throat> can you go into a little bit more detail about the difference between, uh, and this comes from Michelle, by the way, between project management and change management? For example, uh, she's been part of organizations that have two functions here where they lead a human dynamics of change, and then they had a PMO department that handles the budget and function of change. It can be difficult at times to get enough information from the people conducting the change to properly communicate the change, and sometimes they just don't know early enough, and other times they attempt to communicate on their own, and it isn't consistent with other communications that we have distributed. Selling the project managers or leaders on this approach can be a challenge. Well, yeah, you're right, and, and, you know, I was just involved with a project not long ago where we had this particular um, issue, pretty much the same issue, of where the project management team, the people who were involved in the organizational side of it, were always going to that project management team saying, tell us what you're doing, tell us what your milestones are, you know, tell us, uh, you know, what we need to be telling people, what they need to expect, you know, what's happening here, and they, there was resistance to doing that. And the truth behind why there was resistance to doing is that was because they flat out didn't know. They did not themselves have a good plan around the change that they were trying to make and, you know, the strategy for that change, what it was going to be, what it was going to look like. So you have to push back on that project management organization and really get them to understand the fact that, you know, people are, to accept the change, people need to have knowledge about it. They have to buy into it. And to buy into it, you have to manage their expectations. And so you really need to get them to do a better job of being able to set out some milestones and set out some of uh, their objectives and making those public so that you can then do organizational change management around that. So it's really, you know, it, it's, it's not a silver bullet for it, but it's really getting them to understand and buy into how important organizational change management is and the fact that their effort will fail if you fail in organizational change management, which means the entire enterprise is going to fail in what they're trying to do. So it really boils back to, you know, making sure that they understand that their responsibility and from a project management side is to have some good objectives, some good deliverables, have a planned outcome, have some milestones, and then they have to communicate that to the folks who are engaged in organizational change management 
so that they can line up what they need to do and the communications that they need to do around that. It very clearly is a joint effort that both sides have to work together on. Michelle says, yes, gap analysis is a real challenge as well, and she says, thank you. Great. And, you know, that that's actually the only question we can really take at this time. I mean, we really are out of time. So, folks, if you have a question, and I have put in our chat box, simply email me at rich.longo at flycastpartners.com or info at flycastpartners.com, or you can call us at 844 Flycast, that's 844-359-2278. Um, we'll get you an answer if you email us within five business days. If you call in, we'll get you an answer right then and there as quickly as we possibly can. Uh, so I and definitely Rich, encourage you to reach out. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to say, Rich, and for those people who had questions on the other other change management, on really ITIL change management, you know, keep in mind that we have experts in that area too, and we can answer those questions even though we didn't really address those today. But we can really help you with those change management processes and in making sure that those are uh, well developed and well designed and do what you need to do um, to really satisfy that side of change management as well. And those of you that joined us today, I'd like to invite you two weeks from today, and it's not really out there yet, but we have a, a presentation on how many tools does it take to monitor an enterprise. It'll also be uh, two Thursdays from today at 2 p.m. Eastern time. So go ahead and sign up for that. That is on our website. How many tools does it take to monitor an enterprise? I appreciate the time that all of you have taken out of your busy day to spend with us. Uh, I look forward to seeing you on future presentations. If you have any questions, reach out to us. Chuck, thank you. Great presentation. Thank you for your time. Well, you're welcome. You know, as you can tell, I love talking about this. So, Excellent. Very good. Well, folks, I want you to have a great day and enjoy your weekend.